Thanks, everyone. So our next speaker is Oriol Vinales. Uh, everyone knows Oriol, but uh, he's a principal scientist at Google DeepMind, working on deep learning and artificial intelligence. So prior to joining DeepMind, Oriol was part of Go the Google Brain team. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California at Berkeley, uh, and is the recipient of the 2016 MIT 35 Under 35 Innovator Award. Oriol has made fundamental contributions uh, that are at the very core of what we know now as the deep learning revolution. Some of his contributions are used uh, in Google Translate, text-to-speech, speech recognition, serving billions of queries every day. He was the lead researcher of the Alpha Star project, creating an agent that defeated top professional uh, at the game of StarCraft, achieving grandmaster level. So the Alpha Star paper was at the cover of Nature on Wednesday. So Oriol will, give, will be giving uh, the second official talk, the first live stream talk. So it's a privilege for us at Kipu to be uh, witnessing this. So many, many people around the world are waiting for this. Uh, and then uh, finally, I want to say that Oriol has, very strong, uh, has been a very strong supporter of Kipu since this was a crazy idea. And uh, believe me that I'm not exaggerating when I say that he has given us advice 24-7, uh, or, or at least to a subset of us. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what I want to say is that Oriol has really strong co uh, co emotional connections throughout his life to some Latin Americans. Uh, and I'm thinking of people like Lionel Messi, Luis Suarez, and <laughs> Ronaldinho Gaucho. As a good Catalan, he's a hardcore Barca supporter. So please welcome Oriol. OK, this, this was great. I'm emotional at this point, so let me try to recover. Um, I actually have a few words to say back, um, which hopefully many of you would agree with, which is that um, I have witnessed a lot of um, you know, passion, sacrifice, time spent by the organizer team here. And um, in particular, I'm, Mayday is actually my partner. So I, I feel like really happy to be here. Sadly, I could only arrive yesterday, but I almost already lost my voice because I'm so like enthusiastic about um, the whole um, this avenue. So I think um, here we're all excited about artificial intelligence and Latin America. But I will say that there's amazing human intelligence and people that I'm meeting every day now here. So um, I, I would say maybe a big round of applause for the organizers, especially. And of course, everyone here is making this possible. So that's the, the picture on the right is you from a different perspective than I see. Actually, I want to take a selfie. So um, <laughs> let, me, let me put the actual first talk, uh, slide of the talk. Um, all right. <laughs> Sorry, this, this is a bit unusual. OK. Um, <laughs> cool. So, so this talk, I guess we are in the last day. So, so it's about um, really a large project. So of course, many al also thanks go to the Alpha Star team. Um, I didn't do this, of course, on my own, although I've been quite passionate about this topic for, for a few years now. And I'll try to explain this in the talk. Um, but this, this is perhaps a talk that talks about a, a kind of large, complex project, trying to do something pretty difficult with artificial intelligence. So what hopefully many of you can recognize is Many of the things you've learned or heard about in the last few days, hopefully they, some, some of them can come back here, make sense as parts or pieces of the puzzle um, for which you know, eventually we managed to do something that was thought pretty hard to do for a machine learning system. So without further ado, um, this obviously goes without saying, and, and I'm sure you, this has been covered extensively, especially in Nando's lecture, but just to remind ourselves, um, and especially at, at DeepMind, we, we really like this paradigm of reinforcement learning in which 
um, is, is very generic. You have an agent that is probably a neural network, hopefully, that observes and acts upon the world trying to achieve a goal, right? It's a very kind of clean and simple and I like end-to-end -end, um, way to po propose a solution for a problem because the problem here could be really anything that the environment is challenging uh, the agents to do. And one of the very first successes, how I certainly got to know about DeepMind, was the, you know, the paper now quite, quite highly cited and famous on, on Atari, which kind of proposed that uh, a neural network could play this game of Atari that huma as humanity we probably played, played quite extensively through just very basic learning principles, which I fondly believe in, right? I, th I think learning systems are very powerful, and so this was a very cool example. This was presented actually at NeurIPS 2014, and it was, there was a deep learning workshop that at the time was very popular because Mark Zuckerberg actually came, but for me the highlight of the workshop was that this paper was presented. If you remember that, um, I really was amazed by this. Um, so now, you know, Let's look at a bit what DeepMind's mission is. It's, it's important for every one of you to think what's your mission, right? So I, I really like to have a very clear mission statement. And, you know, the mission doesn't say, you know, do play video games, right? So, so why, why do we get to kind of have video games as, or games rather, as a, as a kind of vehicle for, for towards this mission? And I hope this also is conveyed in the next few slides. Uh, but this is DeepMind's mission, is, is kind of solving intelligence and then uh, using it uh, to make the world a better place, which of course aligns very well with, with Google's mission as well, right? So, so how how do we do this, right? This, this is the, the this is what we want to do. How do we actually do it? And I think what games have provided us with is a benchmark, right? In the previous session, actually, we, we talk a lot about data sets and benchmarks and evaluations. So, in a way, games have been quite interesting for humanity to master. I think it requires an amount of creativity, intelligence, and it's certainly fun to play games, board games, video games, and so on. So the approach is, can we see video games or games as a benchmark to assess how far along the way of solving intelligence we are? Um, and as uh, hopefully as a, a side effect, we also will manage to try to tackle other real-world problems uh, with the techniques or maybe parts of the solution that we found to do um, to solve or play really well at games like Atari, as I was mentioning. And then, of course, another example that, in a way, was a bit more challenging than Atari, perhaps because the opponent happens to be another agent that is very symmetric, right? It's, it's improving as you improve. So um, Go was maybe an, 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 an extra axis in this complexity measure that we care so much about to, to evaluate. But importantly, you must kind of follow a reasonable trajectory, right? You couldn't possibly play Go or even StarCraft later, as I'll show, without these prior steps and also without the many building blocks that hopefully you've learned about here this week. So this is the part of the talk that I asked the people in, in the public, how, how many people let me say it, if I ask it in an engaging way. How many people do not know at all what StarCraft is about? Great, 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 awesome. So then, then I can actually try to explain it for, for some of you that might not be familiar with it. Hopefully um, you know chess, right? So I'm, I'm gonna try to map it to chess a little bit. It, it's difficult, I mean, go and watch videos after the talk, but um, StarCraft 2 is so-called real-time strategy game. And the way to map it to chess is perhaps to think about um, a board. So here on the left, uh, it's a bit dark, but you kind of see like a zoomed out version of, of the game. And this board has pieces, right? So it has a few units, as we call them in StarCraft. But the first difference you notice if you look at the game of StarCraft is you don't see the other side of the board, right? So very notably, you, you start with a few pieces, actually. You don't start with all your pieces. You, you, you start with maybe basic, basic units. And then if you want to see what's happening in the other side of the board, you must go and seek information. You must scout to see what's up, right? What, what is the other side doing, which is very different to go or chess. Now, also, you, ha you start with a few pieces, but you need to build or invest in new pieces to eventually build the coolest technology that there is available in the game, right? So 
As a result, you need to always be deciding trading off economical decisions. Will I expand to carry on more economical growth um, because you can r gather some resources in this board called minerals and gas, if you must know. And that makes you more wealthy, which means you can invest in technology and more advanced units that might counter the enemy units better. But of course, you, not, you need to do that with care, because if you just go all the way technological, the enemy can come earlier and defeat you. Uh, and of course, you also need to know what are the units that you need to build all the time, because you're not seeing it. Right? You have to scout and see, oh, if I'm building a lot of rocks, right, and, and the enemy is, is, is building paper, right, then I'm in trouble, right? So, so there's, it's a bit of a kind of a massive rock, paper, scissor system that the players of the game play. Uh, so, and then, of course, the actual objective is you go and you actually destroy all the buildings, and if you do that in the one versus one setup, you win. Although many people end up quitting the game or resigning before that actually happens. Um, and this is maybe another view um, which shows the actual UI or interface that players use, right? So, so you can see here someone has these workers going back and forth, right? These are the blue things, are the minerals. And this person is moving the camera, right? It, it, it moves the camera, so the, the bottom left there you see the, the, the so-called minimap, that's the zoomed out view of the world. And you know, this person is building new workers to gather more resources, building a building, um, kind of flickering around the bit units, which is useless, but it's actually important because it makes you faster with actions, which we'll get to that later. And it's very, a very natural interface. There's a lot of clicking, there's drag and drop, there's all these actions that you would actually encounter in real uh, programs, right? That you have to move icons around and so on. So the interface, unlike um, Go or Atari, where the action set is, is fairly small, is very natural. It's a very natural UI uh, or way to interact with a complicated program or game in this case. So in this sort of benchmark for, for AI, um, StarCraft really, of course, challenges um, the previous environments a bit more. Um, notably, the information type is imperfect. As I was saying, you don't get to see all that is happening all the time, so your agent has to have memory and do a lot of inference about how to play optimally. And then maybe the other one that's, that's fairly drastic is the action space. So in StarCraft, if you think of all the possible click combinations with the mouse and keyboard and so on, it turns out that there's quite a large action space um, because there's a combinatorial set of units that you can move around and issue orders to. So it's, it's a fairly challenging task. And of course, as usual in machine learning, the more, the, the more challenging the task is, the, the, most, the more fun it gets, to be honest. Right? So um, to me, when I saw this, I thought, OK, this would be a great way to learn reinforcement learning and also to stress test the deep learning models that we so much love. And so actually, StarCraft has been used as an AI research platform for a few years now. Um, in fact, it was first proposed circa 2003. And then since 2010, there's been an AI versus AI competition going on um, held by the community, which is very active and very enthusiastic about this. So our involvement really um, started only in 2016, which is the year I actually moved from, from Brain to DeepMind. And the first step we did there was to open source both the environment or the game engine, and also we open source critically something that will come back later, which is what so, uh, the so-called replays, which are the games that are played online. Blizzard was very, um, very nice to anonymize them and put them as a massive sequence modeling data set for people to play with. Right? So we'll get to back to that later. So we open source it, and then um, I'm here to explain you a bit the, also what happened in the history of the project ever since we open source and we start tackling the full game of StarCraft. One thing that I look back to and I, I find interesting was that back in 2011, I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and uh, Dan Klein, who was the, the, the professor leading the project at Berkeley that built an AI that actually win the, won the first competition in 2010, he decided that it would be fun to teach AI to students, so please consider this if you want to you know, kind of excite students to work on AI um, in your universities. So he decided that to teach certain concepts of AI, it would be more fun to see it happen in a video game, right? So at the time in the class, things like 
um, A star algorithms, which sounds a lot like alpha star, but it's a different thing. So, so pathing algorithms, planning algorithms, all sorts of kind of maybe more towards classical AI systems were explained in the class, of course, but then the homeworks involved students actually implementing this and then seeing it, how, they, how their agents that were playing the game were acting or were using these algorithms, which I think pedagogically was quite interesting. But what also stood out at the time was that um, he had this slide from the class and he said no single AI technique can solve this problem off the shelf. And probably, of course, at the time this was true, but I think what amazed me is that we managed to have a single neural network that can pretty much play the game at very high level. And so I think this talks to the, you know, the progress in the field. And really, at the time, I kind of had dreams of doing this when I was working on this project. And actually, I got to meet people like Ilya actually through this game, because my first email about RNNs was on StarCraft. Anyways, long story. But it really is the case that um, it felt really, really hard to do this with a single technique. And that's why this was taught as part of a class uh, that the curriculum was you know, showing several AI techniques. So the next part is interesting, because we are at the point now that we say we're going to play one versus one. And although this actually hasn't been considered by prior researchers too much, um, we had to be careful about, well, a machine will play the game differently, will observe the game differently. There are many things that there's so many caveats that are, that are impossible to make you know, in sort of equal ground with players that play the game. But one that stands out a lot is how professionals control the keyboard and the mouse so to interact with the game as we saw in that first person view. So this is a professional gamer. The sound it is only, the only video that has sound, but I didn't connect it because I thought it was not worth it. But you can imagine the amount of clicking um, that is going on given the movement of the hands of the professional player. So, so these players can issue hundreds of actions per minute quite precisely to the game when they have to a lot of action in terms of moving units around and issuing commands, multitasking, right? So it's very important to be really, really fast. And um, again, it's very impressive to see this live, actually, I, I, or at least look, take a look at videos. It's, it's very impressive, right? So, so when we tackled this, we, th we, we thought, what could we do? And you know, the first approach would be, OK, OK, well, let's create a robotic arm to play the game. And we saw an excellent talk about robotics yesterday. But looking at the skill of this player and looking at, I'll put, of course, the mandatory canonical video of robots not doing great, this is, this is, this is maybe not very fair to the field. <laughs> but it must be said that you know, tackling the problem in this truly end-to-end -end fashion was out of scope. And maybe I can convince Chelsea to collaborate on a project like having a robot arm instead of moving the balls around. Maybe they eventually can play or interact with the keyboard. That would be very cool. But this is not something we could do. So the problem was, how do we design or enforce limitations to the agent so that the game essentially does not break? Right? And it is a tricky question that we face during the project. So after moving on from another favorite slide, I'm going to kind of summarize a bit what Pablo was mentioning. So we recently published research. Of course, a lot of the details are in the paper. So I recommend you, for those of you who are interested, read the paper, ask questions at the end of the talk. You can always email me as well, and so on and so forth. But let's, let's look a bit at, you know, digest what are the machine learning, reinforcement learning challenges in this domain. Well, the obvious ones is that this is very complex data, right? The inputs, the states are very complicated. There's, a, there's the image aspect of the game, but there's also all these units that happen to be in the map that you must control. The action space is very high dimensional. We have a combinatorial number of actions. That, that is something that in RL is, is very rare to, to even try to tackle. And of course, things in the game happen only at the end. You get a reward, whether you win or loss. And we didn't, we tried, I mean, it, it's obviously an obvious thing to do to reward the agent to achieve sub goals, but designing sub goals in a game like StarCraft is extremely hard. So instead, and in the solution, we decided to just give a reward for winning or losing the game. But of course, winning or losing the game 
lots of steps are required to achieve that, right? Thousands of steps. So, so that's the obvious axis of complexity. And for that, we have a lot of work done on architecture, scaling up computation, and using better reinforcement learning techniques. And I'll describe a little bit of this. Second one is, it is very hard to find good strategies in StarCraft. And I'll show you a video that exemplifies an extreme case. But these games require a lot of coordination and a lot of very precise things to happen for a strategy to be valid. And this domain makes this problem quite challenging. So exploration is definitely a problem. And as Chelsea was saying yesterday, imitation learning here is how we solved it. Um, so I'll describe results and, and how uh, imitation learning worked in this domain later as well. And then last but not least, once you start playing the game, you end up obsessing about certain strategies, almost like zooming in too much. And as a result, your agents become a bit monotonic or a bit boring and not robust enough. So we also introduced um, what we call the leak training approach that I'll describe as well in the talk um, in a second. So, and of course, the other axis of complexity is how do we make sure that there is some notion of fairness when we play this game? Because we intend to, of course, play this game against players, and so we would like the players to be happy with the constraints that we impose to the agents, so not, not to allow tens of thousands of actions per minute that even that professional player couldn't possibly issue. So what is AlphaStar? Um, this, that gets tricky, actually, when you write a paper, because we, you keep mentioning AlphaStar, and at the end of the day, the reviewers ask, is this the algorithm? So AlphaStar is really the agent, and this is probably the simplest kind of entry point for us to understand uh, what is it, what's the final product, what's that single AI um, agent that plays the game. And it's as simple, actually, as this. It's a model-free agent, so unlike yesterday, this runs on a single GPU, once you train the weights, which of course is the tricky part, you essentially get this loop that we saw in reinforcement learning many times where the game sends you some observations. You have a neural net that takes the observations and produces actions. These actions are complicated, and I'll describe them in the next slide. And then there's actually some layers to ensure we don't issue too many actions per minute. So there's some limits to issuing at most 24, 22 actions for, per, for, per five seconds, which is pretty realistic. And uh, we talked to professionals, and they, they were OK with this limitation. Then you send the action, action gets issued, and so on. And another important thing is this is a real-time game. So when we train it, we pause the game. We take the image. We kind of feed forward through the network. And then we send the action back. But when we actually play online or against people, we cannot Pause people's brain. Um, so we then have to deal with an extra delay, right? That we observe the game, we will compute something, we'll send the action back to the game, and then the game state might have progressed maybe 50, 100, 150 milliseconds. But that's OK, because we also have, of course, delay in processing observations. So that actually helped us achieve a delay um, fairness as well there. So this are figures from the paper that I'll try to unpack a little bit in the next few slides. But overall, there is a supervised learning component or imitation learning component. That's, that's the simplest. Then there's reinforcement learning, which is pretty simple as well, given what you hopefully know at this point in the, in the summer school. And then there's what we call the leak training, which maybe I'll, I'll spend some time to explain. It's, it's very intuitive, though, so I think it's going to be fairly easy to explain this part. And funnily enough, looking at this, I realized that part of this figure looks a bit like a kipu, actually. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> I, could, I could have done the figure even look more like a kipu, but I think this is maybe, the, yeah, the connections are everywhere. Now I see kipus everywhere. So um, <laughs> anyways, is that, yeah, there's a very beautiful kipu here. So, so let's talk about how are these stages of training AlphaStar, right? What are they, um, at least a little bit, and Hopefully, you'll start also recognizing some more keywords from the school this week. So let's start with the basic. And I'll describe a bit more actions. I said there's many actions, and they're combinatorial. So this is just an example of what is the agent deciding every time step to do. And it's actually fairly intuitive. Agents have access to 
all the units in the game, and they issue sort of instructions to them to build buildings, to build units, to move, to go scout, to build a new base, to gather minerals or gas. So in this case, this action in particular created this crystal force field that blocks a ramp, which is an element of the map, um, that is something very commonly used to kind of block an incoming attack or delay an attack. So you put this kind of thing that is temporary here, and then you, you have some time maybe to gather your, your, your units around to defend better. So this particular action requires a few arguments. It's a bit like an API or a function call into the game. It's, it's very intuitive and very generic, actually. Any sort of computer program that can define uh, you know, a library of functions that you can call into to achieve a reward, that the, the same architecture and principles really apply, which is amazing, right? So the first thing that you must decide is what is the action that you're going to do? In this case, we decided that we're going to issue a force field action, which creates this crystal. That's the name. Who is issuing this action, right? There's many units. Who is actually going to execute this force field action? And in this case, we can see that the units selected are these seven. So the agent decided to issue the action on the group of units comprised by four sentries and three stalkers. This action can only be realized by the sentries, but that people do this all the time. You can issue an action to a group, and then the game engine figures out which unit does the action. Um, and crucially, we, we did not kind of specify any knowledge about which units can issue, issue which, which actions. This was all learned by the algorithm. Then where is an important question. Where do you put this force field now that you said who is doing that? And then on the ramp or the XY coordinates are something else that the agent must decide to output. And then when is also important, because we don't act every frame. Otherwise, we would be issuing tens, on, tens of thousands of actions. So the agent decides a delay for when it's going to observe and act next, which could be, in a second, please give me the next observation, and I'll decide what to do then. So the agent has to a priori say, the delay until the next action. And then we have a special mechanism that is, if you want to repeat an action, you can. I mean, many people do that, especially for the race Zerg. If you know what I'm talking about, you might know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyways, so repeating action is also something the agents do, although most of the times actions are issued once, of course. So, so this, of course, that's kind of the, 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 the nicest part, which is, this is the neural architecture that manages to map the inputs to the outputs. But the cool thing is here, all the components that I'll explain um, are fairly generic general purpose learning algorithms, right? So it's, it's hopefully going to come up with almost the obvious solution given the deep learning toolbox that I was mentioning actually in the morning. Um, we just take that toolbox or architecture component and plug it in in the places that they're almost necessary for you to create an agent that potentially can cope with the complexity of input-output space that StarCraft proposes, right? So let's look at how we encode the observations. So observations in StarCraft, the way we act or observe rather on the game, they're not quite like the raw pixels. Playing from raw pixels would increase quite a lot um, the amount of data required. So we did a kind of a approach where we use image imagery from the game, <coughs> namely this zoomed out view called minimap. That's input um, here in the right called minimap. But then we also have another modality, if you will, of seeing the game, which is just seeing a structure or a list of the units in the game. Right. So this is just a vector or a set of units that are present in the current state of the game. And that's, that, that is extremely important. And then last but not least, there's scalar features such as how many minutes have, have, have the, has the game been played for? Games typically last tens of minutes, perhaps. And other scalar features that are cool, for example, that are important for imitation learning is, what's the skill of the player I'm trying to imitate? So actually, we pass a number, which is called MMR, which is how strong you are, also in, at, as part of a scalar feature. So these are three streams of data. How are they encoded? OK, not surprisingly, the minimap, which is an image, is encoded with a deep ResNet, right? So that's the standard image or computer vision um, component that you would use. A scalar features, this is a vector. Um, it's encoded with an MLP or deep neural network. Um, that's, that's also extremely trivial. And then these entities or this set of units, um, because we know how powerful transformers are, um, we just heard this probably a few times, and I saw some amazing posters, actually, we decided to encode this set of units 
This set in StarCraft happens to be about less, always less than 512 elements, so we have a set of up to 512 units, and we encode that with a transformer, uh, which crucially does not consider these 512 units as a sequence, but at an, as an actual set, which is very natural because transformers without the positional encodings actually are encoding sets. So that was a great coincidence. And once you encoded this with these three different architectures, we take the vectors at the top, the embeddings, we concatenate them, and we put them in a deep LSTM, which is what serves as a memory for the agent. So again, fairly conventional architecture, although, of course, it's very state of the art. We use transformers. We use a few tricks found in the computer vision community and so on and so forth. Now, my favorite part is the head of the agent, what actually converts the state into an action. And it's my favorite because, of course, it relates quite a lot with sequence modeling, language modeling, actually, and so on and so forth. So the almost only way you could conceivably output a one-hot vector out of 10 to the 26, you wouldn't possibly want to train a softmax over that. So what you're going to do is you're going to decompose actions into sub-actions, but still model the joint probability of this action with the chain rule, which is exactly how language model works, right? So imagine a little bit that in StarCraft we must output words. Words are your actions. And then sub-actions would be characters, right? So this is we are outputting sort of components of this function call that I mentioned as an autoregressive head. The way it works is, again, extremely simple, except for the last two, which are a bit special. So we output the action type, force field. This is a softmax over maybe 500 or so actions that StarCraft has. Then condition on the action type, we output the delay, how, much, how many frames we delay until the next frame. Then given that, those two, we encode whether we are queuing this action or not. I didn't mention that before, but there's, if you press Shift, then you are queuing an action with the, your, your keyboard. And then the, la the next two, uh, or three rather, are quite interesting. So the first one is probably the most, the one that requires some sort of merging all the things we know about attention, autoregressive models, and so on, which is which subset of units will issue this action. I have a set of up to 512 units, and now 1, 2, 54, a subset of these units, I will issue, move these units somewhere or create this force field in the ramp. So to pick the subset of units, it's actually quite natural to use PointerNet, which is a paper that came a few years ago, which is co-authored by Mayde, actually, as well, and Navdeep from Brain. And it was the obvious thing to do is you point to one unit of the set, right? So you do an attention mechanism. You point to the first unit of the set that you want the action to be issued to. And then, given the first unit that you pointed to, you point at the second unit. And then you point at the third unit. And you, do this, you kind of unroll this computation so you have a recurrent pointer network that keeps pointing at units until you point at a special token, which is, I'm done. I'm done pointing. This is the subset from the set that I want to issue this command to. So that's how you select units. And then some actions require you to target at a particular unit, in which case you just use a regular one step and roll pointer network. This is the unit I'm casting this shield on, or something like that. And some actions require coordinates, spatial coordinates, like the ramp uh, building for this crystal then that would be a target point that is simply a conf deconf network um, coming from the minimap coordinates. So this pretty much describes sort of the architecture we designed. Um, again, it's somewhat specific to the modalities present in StarCraft. But of course, if you have any computer program that has lists, sets, images, sequences, you can just mix and match these components, which is a bit the point right, of deep learning. And then the question is, well, how do you train that, right? That's, that's, that becomes like the tricky next, next bit. But this is what AlphaStar is, is this architecture. So I was saying before, and the first step, step of how do we train these weights from all these components that will have matrices of learnable parameters. We tried, of course, several things. But what ended up being quite successful, I would say almost surprisingly successful, was imitation learning. And I really like imitation learning, or as Chelsea also said yesterday, so-called behavioral cloning. 
because it is exactly the same as what you do in sequence modeling of language. It's simply you observe a sequence of observations of words or of pairs of um, sentences translating each other, and you just train to maximize the likelihood of all the sequences in your training set, and that's how you optimize the parameters. And in StarCraft, it's exactly the same. We have um, quite a few replays from players who issued actions at certain time steps from certain observations. And as a first step, we just train that to imitate these human moves, so to speak, right? And if you don't do that, if you just use reinforcement learning with self-play, what ends up happening is a bit surprising, but not so much in retrospect. So what you're seeing here is an agent that does not try to imitate human play at all, but it, it cares about winning. And what it decided to do is take all its workers out of work and send them to the opponent's base, which is called as a worker rush. And it actually, I mean, it's, some people do this. I mean, it's, it's easy to play like this. Um, it, it, I'm not sure you know, it's very nice to play like this, but it's certainly possible. And the surprising thing is that an agent that trained um, without any sort of imitation at, got attracted to this, and it's not very surprising, right? Um, I'll replay this. The problem is, if you do random actions in this very large action space, the very first thing you'll do is take your workers and move them around, scatter them in the map, and do some nonsensical thing, right? So one of these episodes or trajectories, you will happen to maybe go to the opponent base. The opponent doesn't understand the game at all. It's the agent that is a random agent. So if you actually attack the main building, by luck, right? Randomly, you will do that in some episodes. You win, you gather a, re a reward, and then re you reinforce that behavior. And then you zoom in into this very naive strategy very quickly. And let me tell you, against humans, this doesn't work. Um, I mean, some, maybe some, it, it works to some extent, but, it, but it's not the recommended, let's say, way to play the game. But also surprisingly, this agent actually beats the, the built-in bots that are present in the, in the game. So this is actually the agent playing against the cheat insane AI, which is the 10th level of difficulty, uh, which also tells us that, of course, rule-based approaches like the ones that are present built in in the game, they also, of course, have limitations and they can be exploited. Um, you can actually see that the other side tries to defend, but the agent is smart and hides behind the, the minerals and so on, right? So it's, it's an interesting problem and you can start understanding the exploration issue that we heard about being so critical to solve in a game like StarCraft. So as I was saying, in imitation learning, all you do is minimize the KL divergence between the policy action. Here is just this autoregressive softmax for all these different action components that I described against a very large data set of human replays that we gathered. And these replays come from a bunch of skill levels for players. Like the players are placed in leagues online, and we, we start from Platinum, Diamond, Master, and Grandmaster. And you simply train to imitate the actions. You don't understand winning at all, because this is not a reward system. This is simply imitation learning. And additionally, we also condition uh, the policy with a high-level latent vector that essentially summarizes an episode that will serve a purpose later on in the Alpha Star League. And it turns out that this agent with pure imitation happens to be quite all right, actually. It plays the game quite well. Um, in fact, in our internal test ELO, ELO is a score of uh, very widely used in chess, 400 ELO points are equivalent to a win rate of 90%. So if I'm 400 ELO points lower than you, you will beat me 90% of the time, so that you get a, an idea of the scale of ELO. So we see that no human data but using self-play gets to about 100 ELO points. And without reinforcement learning, just the imitation learning agent actually gets to 900 ELO points, which is much stronger, right? And this is against a held out set of agents that we tried and we published uh, in many ablations in the Nature paper. So one other cool thing that you can do with imitation learning, this is essentially a bit of image net or language modeling. We have a loss, we minimize the loss, and so to decide every of these components that we start adding to the agent architecture, 
we could do all these ablations based simply on imitation learning. So if you have an idea of a better architecture to play StarCraft, it's much simpler to add it and retrain the model on supervised data and see if it plays better than to just run the whole process, right? Because that would cost a lot of time. So here, there's an ablation where all these components that I described, pointer networks, transformers, scatter connections, which I did not really define very well, or predicting action delays, made the win rate of the supervised agent against the best bot built in the game, essentially from 0%. We beat the easier bots, but not the harder before this point, to beating it about 87% of the time, OK? So that, I think it's, it's very, and, and if you see the agent play, it really kind of seems like it's playing the game like a human would to some extent, which is very nice to see. Now, I'll describe a little bit very intuitively how reinforcement learning works, which is the next step. First step is we take essentially hundreds of thousands of games from humans, so it's a fairly large data set, and imitate it. The next step is reinforcement learning, right? So if you do self-play, that means you play against yourself, and now you only update your parameters based on whether you won or lost a game, right? That's the only reward we care about. Um, the, the very first thing that stands out, of course, is that you must use this initial policy. You want to initialize it with the weights that you've learned on imitation data. So remember, no human data is here at the bottom. Supervised agent, no reinforcement learning, has 900 points. If you take the initial weights and you fine-tune them with self-play, it gets a bit better, but actually, surprisingly, it doesn't go much higher. It maybe gains 100 ELO, ELO points if you simply initialize the policy and train. What helps a lot is this idea of knowledge distillation, which um, Jeff and, and I and Jeff Hinton co-authored some years ago, which is a very simple idea, which is, look, train with self-play, update the parameters with reinforcement learning, but please, try to not do the distribution of our actions should not be very different to the prior distribution that humans do based on the model you train on human data with imitation, right? So that's just putting some pressure for the policy to not deviate too much from the initial weights, right? That's, that's essentially the, the high-level intuition. And it's a very simple loss that you add to reinforcement learning. Um, it's actually a form of imitation learning, of course, as you train with reinforcement learning. And that actually increased the ELO score by 400 points. And the one that I don't have too much time to talk about is this idea of the latent vector, which um, increased the ELO score by another 100 points. So the last piece of the puzzle, the, the Kipu figure, right, is multi-agent. And that's where it got really fun, because even, even when you train with self-play, and you, you really say, oh, please, keep close to the human prior, so that you, you see all the strategies as you play the game. You don't want to degenerate. Of course, you're not going to degenerate to the worker rush approach. That's too simple. But what often can happen is you tend up to focus on a few strategies, and you forget other strategies if you just train via self-play. So the idea of the leak training is actually imitating quite a bit how people play the game online, which is they use a, a system called Battle.net. And then many strategies sort of emerge, right? You might invent a new strategy, you go and you test it online, and then other players eventually experience the strategy you invented, and they think of a counter strategy, and then the whole meta in the game, that's the, the, the way that they call it, evolves over many years that the game has existed. So the idea of the leak training is essentially to say, look, I'm going to have my main three agents who are training against themselves, and they are training against this massive population of agents that I'm creating. So the main agents play against the, 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 the live version of the, the main agent, but they also play against checkpoints of their own past, right? So every, every now and then, I say, OK, I'm going to drop the weights. This is a new agent, and you, you don't want to forget to play against past strategies, right? So that's, that's a very simple um, set of strategies. That's called fictitious self-play, and, and it's a technique that existed. Um, for a while, and it helps a little bit, but what helped a lot is to create new kinds of agents. These agents, they're not trying to beat everyone, they're trying to beat the main agent only from the prior, so they start from the human prior, and their obsession is to beat the main agents. They don't care about beating everyone, and the, crucially, the main agents don't get to see the strategies that these exploiter agents find at first. 
So the way it works is you create an exploiter. It plays against the main agent for a while. The main agent is not aware of this new strategy. Eventually, the exploiter managed to beat maybe more than 70% of the time, say, against the main agent. At which point, the exploiter says, I'm going to add myself to the leak. I'm going to expose the strategy that I found you to be weak against. And then I'm going to try something, something else by res resetting my weights to the supervised policy. And this idea was critical to make um, the whole leak and the whole experience uh, for the agents way more diverse and robust against all sorts of cheese strategies that these agents find uh, in real play. And just to exemplify this, um, this is a, a small video that shows the game, but it is actually from the actual training of AlphaStar. So what you see here is in blue, you see the main agent. And in red, you see an agent that found this strategy called Cannon Rush, which is building cannons close to the enemy base. And you see it succeeded. And now the blue agent, he's at, it's at home, right? So you just build it at the enemy base very, very quickly. And the blue agent, at this point, does not know what to do. Maybe this strategy is not present in its, its own set of strategies that it knows. And the red agent will succeed, right? And this is, the red agent is an exploiter. It tries to refine this strategy. Eventually, the red agent drops a checkpoint. And now the, 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 the blue agent actually knows that if it sees these buildings early on, it must actually go and essentially freak out and defend, right? And it sends all the workers. It does these early, build, uh, early units to defend against this, and eventually manages to beat the counter, have a counter strategy for this cannon rush. Right? And then later on, we see, for instance, exploiters that found, for instance, in this case, invisible units that the main agent maybe is not super good against, but eventually it becomes better because exploiters start kind of traversing strategies that are actually interestingly discovered by human players as well uh, to play the game well. So this was very cool to see. This is actually data from the, from the agents, and it shows the idea more pictorically of this idea of exploiters that exploit the main agent, drop a checkpoint, main agent becomes good against them, but then, of course, a new exploiter comes in and so on and so forth. It's a very nice natural way to scale up. Um, I'll skip these plots. They are actually in the blog post. But um, in numbers, remember, we left the best architecture was around 1,500 ELO. And adding the exploiters increases the ELO score yet once more 300 points, uh, making the agents not only better at playing the game, but actually way more robust. If you see the composition of the league, there are many more strategies once you add uh, exploiters in the league than otherwise. So a last point before we talk just briefly in the last 10 minutes, perhaps, about the results is scale. All these techniques are very data hungry. The imitation learning, Chelsea was saying, one drawback of imitation learning is you need the data to imitate from. Otherwise, you cannot do imitation learning. So many of the results that we know from reinforcement learning in general required a lot of experience accumulated onto the agent to play the game. In particular, for AlphaStar, the eldest agent is playing the game for 200 years. These are, this is a very interesting life, I'm sure, but it's not something that professional players can, of course, do. Um, and then other examples like Capture the Flag, which is another paper that was released last year, or OpenAI 5, they all require a lot of experience to play these games, which is, of course, something that it would be good to work on as a research direction. So let me describe briefly also what happened uh, with the community, which is excellent. I think um, the project had, of course, research challenges, but we also interacted with an amazing community of StarCraft players that really loved the project. So um, the very first thing that we did actually earlier um, this year was uh, to have a demonstration match where we invited two professional players. And we showed the first version of Alpha Star, if you will, that um, we have some differences from since then. And there's actually a, pod, uh, a broadcast on YouTube if you want to see this event. Um, it was quite nice, and we presented this to the community. And so since then, we, as Pablo was saying, literally two days ago, uh, we had this cover, which hopefully you understand the leak, although it doesn't look like a kipu as much because it's circular. But you get the idea, hopefully. Um, it, it's supposed to be abstract. But um, anyways, so the paper is out there for more details. But the things that obviously changed in January were that in January, we had only one race. StarCraft has three races. And at back then, we were playing Protoss versus Protoss on a single map. So 
for us to evaluate this in the wild, we of course had to cover playing against all races, which sort of implied we ourselves had to become good at the three races of the game, because we're using self-play. So if you want to become good to play against, let's say, Protoss, you must play Protoss well, and so on and so forth. So we extended um, the agent very simply by adding more agents to the league, as you saw before, to specialize on each race. So we have a single neural network that plays one race, and in total we have three neural networks playing each of the three races, which is a fairly natural distinction. People generally choose to play one race and specialize on that. And then we must play more maps, because when we evaluate it online, um, there is a, a certain set of maps that you play on. It's not only one single map. That has several features, like ramps, as I was mentioning before, and so on. Now, critically, from January we learned quite a bit. It turned out that our average actions per minute were reasonable and actually below professional players, but the agents developed spikes of actions that were too high, right? So um, agents discovered that in certain points in the game they had to issue lots of actions, and that created some strategies that became unreasonably strong. It's a bit like if rock um, in rock, paper, scissors suddenly becomes very, very powerful, then your agents will start only building rocks, right? So, um, we had a lot of iterations with the community and professional players, and we have now a new set of reduced actions per minute, which I think overall people have been quite happy with, um, and this is on the Asian limitation size. And then, last but not least, in January we mostly played versions of the agent that didn't see all the units in the game, that would be cheating, but they actually perceived the whole map, sort of in a zoomed out fashion. And now we added actually the capability to use a camera, for which we had a preview in January, um, that deals with the issue that, as a human, you cannot possibly kind of multitask everywhere at the same time, and you must move the focus of attention. And this actually reduces the, the win rate against the built-in AI. You cannot quite see it very well there, but it reduces it by 10%. So it makes the problem more challenging, but we had to play like this. Um, we felt like it was not playing the full game if we didn't add the camera aspect, which humans very much know how to master. So what happened after is we added, um, with, in collaboration with Blizzard, an option for players to opt in, right? So players were told, hey, you might be playing artificial intelligence agents. If you want, uh, you can click opt in or opt out. And we were very happy that essentially about 80% of players opted in to play against, potentially play against Alpha Star. In the experiment we performed for the Nature paper, we decided to play anonymously, which means you play with a, a name that is not very recognizable. Um, we wanted to experience the, distribu the prior distribution of our strategies over this space of online play. And amazingly, we had basically an experiment where we played hundreds of games um, against people. It was super fun to be in the office those days to experience sort of the first game we played online, I mean, I thought, wow, this, this person on the other side really doesn't know like, that, that, that she or he is playing against Alpha Star. So it was really cool also like, kind of from a research perspective to actually put this thing to play online in the wild because it really looked exactly like the game, right? We had a Windows machine that an agent connected to and it just basically went and queued and played against a random player. That's how the matchmaking system of Blizzard works. So the highlight of the result, I think, is twofold. Supervised or imitation learning is actually surprisingly good. So here you can see the ELO score that Blizzard uses in their servers called MMR, and this is the amount of players that are above that MMR, right? So um, players are organized in leagues. Some players are in bronze league. Many players are in gold and platinum league. The 50th percent percentile of player is about between gold and platinum, right? And then the imitation learning agent actually managed to score in about half Diamond League, which is above 85% of, of all the players that are actively playing the game, which is surprising. It's actually quite good. But then, of course, the, all the ideas that I discussed with self-play and the league training um, catapulted basically the performance to this very high region, these top 200 players in a region that reached this grandmaster status. And you can see it here, zoomed in, it's a bit squished here. And you can see that with the three races surprisingly close to each other, although Protoss was actually quite stronger, um, as, as people in the community also acknowledged. Um, but Alpha Star managed to score in this Grandmaster region, which, of course, we're very happy about. But one of the highlights for me is how people actually 
didn't recognize they were playing against Alpha Star immediately. They had to really go and see the game after you played. And after a few hundred games, someone online on Reddit, they start saying, oh, I think I played Alpha Star. So that also was pretty cool to see. But the fact that the agents feel quite human-like, of course, it's in part thanks to imitation. But to me, passing, so to speak, the Turing test of StarCraft was perhaps a bigger achievement than whatever ranking or your agent gets to. And also, the community reacted in several ways. This is Kelazur, who is actually a player from Brazil, a professional player. And I really like this quote. So he's saying that AlphaStar is intriguing, an orthodox player, uh, one with reflexes and speed of the best pros, but strategies and style that are entirely its own. So some strategies are re reasonably close to humans, but some clearly in details, um, they, they differ. And I really like their take at the end, which is there's a lot to learn, perhaps, from these agents. So for me, kind of one also success story would be, well, we do imitation learning. Agents kind of improve upon that with the league. How great would it be if humans now did imitation learning back from Alpha Star games, right? So um, we put all the games online. Hopefully, people are already analyzing and hopefully understanding the game in different ways than, than they have so far. And I'm looking forward to seeing that. And last but not least, this literally happened a week and a half ago where we were all in LA. We went to this convention that is for games. It's about 40,000 people um, in California. And there we actually wanted to do one more experiment, if you will, more actually for, it's not really an experiment, but more for just giving a bit to the community for them to have the ability to experience AlphaStar. So one thing we did was we actually set up some, mach some machines in the floor of the convention for people to just come and challenge AlphaStar. So um, you can see the setup here. We had actually about 30 machines in the Google offices in, in, I think it was close to Los Angeles airport. They were connected with Anaheim, which is where the convention center is about, right? So you, you, and then people were essentially here sitting down and they could essentially play against AlphaStar and we had two days, basically, of people coming and stopping by and playing. And it was really fun. It was great to see. It's very blue, but I mean, that's how it looked like. So it's a, it's, it's a video gaming convention. So it's a bit, it's a bit unusual, let's say. But uh, it's actually very, it's very nice, actually, I, 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 um, I must say. So we had a lot of players coming, right? And actually, what started happening is people also started putting their victories against AlphaStar. So I think this is Jacqueline, she, she, was, she, she beat the, the, the basic agent, so we actually put two agents to play. One that was the basic agent, including the imitation learning agent, which is about diamond. And then we also had the advanced agent, which is, was actually a mixture, but mostly like grandmaster level, right? Um, so we played kind of about 1,000 games. Um, and this obviously was non-anonymous, because people kind of, uh, and I feel actually people might have played worse because maybe they somehow they know they're playing Alpha Star and they play differently. But uh, anyways, it was really, really fun to see. And then perhaps as, as a last thing, the highlight of, of the event was when Serral, who is one of the best players in the world, actually stopped by. And it was a bit of a moment of year to year, everyone sort of came and watched him play against Alpha Star, which was great to see. And um, anyway, so fun times. Uh, so that's really the last event. And as you can see, it's very, very recent. It was literally this month. Um, so. Let me recap, and then we can do questions. And, and, and of course, I'm happy to also answer emails later. So I think, to me, the, the most profound thing here is that there's a single neural network, single set of weights that play the game competitively. It's a bit revealing that it's model-free. You might think that planning, and of course, planning is important. But so far, we did not have many successes with model-based RL. So that's perhaps an interesting one to also maybe work with Chelsea and, and colleagues. And Imitation learning, as I, I, I kept saying, it, it actually works really well. So that's maybe a, something to learn is if you want to do RL, but you have actually data, maybe spend some time because tuning the models is very important. But if you tune the model, eventually we, we went from that 0% win rate to essentially 90% win rate against the built-in bot. And the last one that I want to mention is train like you test. So the Alpha Star League, the idea behind it is that People will come with creative strategies all the time. So we wanted to add the capability to do that uh, in this multi-agent setup. And so that's exactly what we designed this in mind of how players can train and improve in a complex strategic domain like StarCraft. And last but not least, this is just a summary of the results. So I'm not going to read it. And then perhaps the last slide, I want to just discuss some frontiers of reinforcement learning, since you probably learned a lot. And there's a lot of caveats, the one of which I already said is the scale of compute. 
So perhaps related is that it would be great to see more successes of reinforcement learning in the real, in real world. The problem is simulating the real world is quite hard. It might be harder to simulate friction and robotics environments and so on uh, than to actually solve the task. So to me, that, is, that tension exists, although there's some very cool work on simulation to real, domain transfer, and so on. So I look for this space for more progress. And then the other one that's pretty annoying, actually, is this idea of transfer, right? So for me, AlphaGo should, should be able to play chess because it's a simpler game in terms of complexity of the search space. Similarly, I would like AlphaStar that plays StarCraft to now be able to be plugged in Atari, and those games are pretty trivial, and it should really be able to play those games. And additionally, I also would like Alpha start to learn from the games that it won and lost online, right? And this idea of rapid learning is actually fairly underdeveloped. There's a lot of research, but successes at this scale are pretty hard to see still. But this is not obviously only for RL. I mean, when you train an image net classifier, it would be great if this thing could just classify MNIST because it's a trivial task. And there's really a, a, a large gap between um, you know, the algorithms work on MNIST, but the weights themselves, how can we reuse these weights? I mean, we're reusing knowledge all the time. And I think this is a pretty profound limitation of deep learning models today. And last but not least, of course, RL comes with new things. Uh, in the causal talk yesterday, we heard reinforcement learning being asked as, how can we understand theory? And I think I would encourage people that want to think about theory hard to not delay entering in the reinforcement learning paradigm, which is slightly different because it's non-stationary and pretty tricky. And with that, thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the awesome talk. Uh, so let's take some questions. Hello. Hey. Uh, I think it was very impressive the performance you could achieve uh, solving StarCraft. And my question is that now that we are trying, uh, we are solving StarCraft, we can scale to the more challenging scenario in which we can have team play. For example, two against two, three against mm. three players in those strategy games. And I wanted to know if you have uh, the ambition of solving this uh, scenario and mm how much you think we are far from solving this collaboration problem? Yeah, so th this is a great question. The question is about, of course, we play the canonical professional gamer played one versus one, but in StarCraft you can play as a team. And I would say that um, StarCraft, the game itself, has been mostly tuned to be balanced in one versus one. That being said, and uh, in, the, in the slide that I kind of passed through quite quickly, but there are lots of cool work on teamwork games. So um, I w want to highlight, of course, Dota 2, that OpenAI play. That's a five versus five game. And the game is meant to be five versus five. The one versus one is, is actually not that interesting. So that, the techniques, and so, it, there's some differences. But of course, you can see overall that good performance can also be achieved in those setups. And then another work that I mentioned is this of Capture the Flag, which I think is six versus six. And it's more like a three-dimensional environment where you need to capture the flag of the enemy and so on. And that also, the, there's an awesome paper in science um, last, year, la, la, last year, not last year, um, that um, talks about actually analysis very nicely. The, the data analysis in the paper is amazing. How the agents kind of learn to collaborate or, or you, you stay back in the base defending the flag and, and, and the sub-team forms and goes and, and seeks you know, the, the opponent's base and so on. So that paper from a multi-agent collaborative space is, is very good. And I think essentially the answer is these techniques will work, but also it's a very interesting setup to think about agents collaborating, of course, um, not, all, not only like competing, right? So it's very cool, but lots of research is actually happening, which I'm, I'm quite happy about. Thanks. Cool. OK, maybe one more question. Yeah. Okay. I, I can repeat the question. There's one here. You, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat it out loud. It's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can start again. So yeah. the question is about fairness, and you mentioned the number of movements per second or 
five seconds. Uh, but then you also mentioned the time of training. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about deciding what constitutes fairness? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and why does it matter if you're trying to win the Touring Yeah, six, yeah, it's a good But point. if you're not. So, so let, there's a few questions. So, so maybe I'll answer the last one, which is, well, why, why does fairness matter? And actually, many people ask this. Like, why are you limiting your agent? Treat it as a reinforcement learning project uh, pro problem and just do try to win and, and see what, what comes up. The problem, I think, especially in games like StarCraft, is it's, it's a game that's been designed with some of these limitations in mind. So what we wouldn't do is kind of to break the game, so to speak. As I was saying, I don't, I don't want suddenly for rock to be suddenly very powerful, because then the, the game of rock, paper, scissors becomes uninteresting, right? So I think the question of why do we try to impose as many fairness constraints that seem reasonable as possible is mostly so that we don't break the game that has been carefully designed and actually evolved to many years. The game is not only released, they actually patch the game based on balance issues between races that, that, that people find. So it's really a complicated process. Now, the other question is about, well, there's two questions, really. Maybe one you didn't ask, but I'll answer, <laughs> um, which is the actions per minute is one obvious element of, uh, of imposing some limits for agents, but there are actually quite a few more. Like, how precise are the actions? I mean, people that play might, might get, you know, if they get under pressure, they might start making mistakes and so on. So it's really hard, even if we had the robotic arm, to really say, oh, this is exactly, you know, how, how, how people attack or play the game. So, you know, we, we did something that is reasonable in that aspect, but there's always going to be more. I mean, you see an image. Do you add noise to the image? I mean, certainly we have, a, you know, we have more precision in the center of our eyes. It's a very cool, actually, I think, problem to start thinking about, and, and, and one that I think more people might start discussing. And then last is, OK, fairness about these agents play 200 game years. And of course, professional players play a lot the game, but order of years of the, you know, cumulatively, right? So that's, that's interesting. I think my partial answer to that is, perhaps talking about the research problem as well, which is that of transfer. Um, certainly, people can master this game much quicker. But on the other hand, our neural nets pretty much come with random weights. And in that sense, right, it would be great for more continual learning to happen. Right? I would, I, as I said, I would like to um, have agents that can do all these tasks at once. And I probably would expect, in that case, the amount of time trained would be reduced. But of course, that's an hypothesis. Many people probably believe it's true, but still research is needed. Um, and it would be certainly interesting, though, to kind of limit the amount of experience of agents. And, and there's some papers that do that. And it, we didn't do it in the project. But if you limit it clearly, like the ceiling of performance would be quite, quite lower. But it wouldn't be, it would be still probably above average play, I would say, in terms of percentile. So great question, though. All right, another question. Ah, there. Hey. For example, in the Atari paper, in my opinion, the main contribution was not the superhuman behavior on games, but things like the replay buffer and the target network. Mm -hmm. So in this case, what is your opinion or what's the, the biggest contribution? OK, so that's a great question as well. Um, I think there's one contribution is that if you have a very highly structured, high dimensional action space, this is one way in which you could solve those, those problems. And of course, action spaces in Atari that there's essentially 10 options to choose from, um, that paper showed us how to do it. But for highly structured dimensional action spaces, I would say these things demonstrate um, how to architect the neural network to do it. And I would say that's one of the major contributions. Another one that I think is quite cool is this idea of exploiters which I think relates to some extent with adversarial examples, right? So basically, the TLDR with RL is that if you have an agent, this agent probably has weak spots. So train against the agent to find these weak spots so as to robustify and make the agent more better when you deploy it. And you're going to see samples that are not going to look quite like the ones that you have in the self-play distribution. So this, this, this is one attempt to make the agents more robust. But of course, robustness in, is a, in agents is extremely important. And ideas like the league, I think they, they, they will just kind of be, if you have a complex domain, I think this idea of um, explicitly rewarding 
playing against or robustness is, is going to be important. So I think that's pro probably another contribution. There's some in RL that I didn't touch, like, but look at the paper. But anyways, those are more technical. But th these at high level, I would say these are two of my favorites. OK, thank you. So we, we have a question at, uh, here at front. The guy with the Uruguayan shirt. <laughs> Nice. So two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, can you say a few words on how do you build this vector Z? Uh, and um, does the agent receive the snapshot of uh, the game at the current time, or a past uh, collection of snapshots of the minimap, the amount of units that I have, and all of that? Right. So, so sorry. The second question you're asking: the observation at time t does it include things from the past? Yeah. Yeah. No. Like so, at time t, you observe the minimap of time t and the, the units. Of course, there is an LSTM. So that, mm. that integrates information from the past that is relevant to decide what the next action should be. But at time t, we only input observations at time t. And there's actually an interesting caveat, which is the agent decides, I will act in a second. But actually, during that second, is not observing. So it's kind of you play with your eyes closed, and only you open when you click the mouse and you close them again, which you know, it, it seems to be OK, but uh, it's an interesting um, thing, effect of computation, really. And then on the, the other question, so uh, yeah, can you repeat it? I, I'll, I'll try to. Uh, what is this vector z? Yeah, 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 the vector z. So the vector z is um, it was represented there. There's two things. And this, by the way, is probably the most handcrafted element of the system. Vector z, right? I mean, we could have trained a variation autoencoder. That's maybe future work. But um, the vector z has. The units, the back of words, or the, the, uh, an indicator vector of whether a unit was in this game or not. Okay? So it's a bit like um, a binary vector that says, in this game, these units were present, and these other units were not. Right? So this game had invisible units and air units and so on. So it's a very kind of compact summary, if you will. It's a back of words representation. The other one is, what's the sequence of buildings, the opening, so to speak, that the player in this case does. And this is enough to kind of, it's a strategic vector in, in a way, right? It's, it, it, it's a very coarse way to represent the games, the, the, a summary of the game. And conditioning on it actually works. So you can then have an imitation learning based agent and, and condition it to do certain unit combinations. And it actually executes that policy, which is great then for diversity later on. So for testing time, you will sample one and then commit so to that? Or? Actually, I didn't get to this, but I'm glad you asked. So the question is, when you play online, what do you set Z to be? So this is important. What we do is 10%, it's a bit like dropout. 10% of the time, we set Z to be 0, which essentially means play optimally. Like, don't, you don't care what you build. Try to just play from the prior the best you can. And then when we play online, we always set the Z vector to this no prior, basically. So. It's kind of a training mechanism to have this Z vector, but then in actual play, we set it to all zeros, which um, does whatever the is the kind of the main mode of the agent, if you will. But this, it's a great point. I maybe you should add it to the talk. It's an important point. Thank you. Cool. So, so we have a question online that is, uh, do you use game tree to reason about future moves, or is it a rea reactive system based on the current situation or map? So yeah, that's a good question. It is. Reactive in the sense that there's no planning explicitly. This is a model-free approach. As I described, it's a single neural network that, given what happened in the game so far, that is recorded in the LSTM plus the current state, what is the action? Fit forward with the memory, of course. And we don't do planning. It, it's, it is difficult to plan in such a large state space. If the action space is large, the state space is actually quite larger. Um, I think it would be it's a great research avenue to think about explicit planning models, and maybe we'll see some work later from other labs or ourselves. But for now, it's just reactive in, in, in the sense of it's model free. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's thank Oriol. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.